Okay, we are live. So, hello everyone and welcome to the stream today. Thank you for joining and today we'll be discussing all about Calico. You already know that, you have seen the stream, you have uh, seen the thumbnail of that. Uh, so today I'm joined uh, by uh, Alex, who is the uh, co-founder and CEO at Tigra. So let me just put my airport on. Hey, everyone. So if you are able to hear us, please send a message in the chat. So that we can we can see that. Okay, yeah. we have, hello, 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 Ariman, hello, Saurabh, awesome. So we have folks and uh, uh, everyone can hear us loud and clear, which is good. So welcome all again to the stream and I'm joined by Alex, who is co-founder and CTO at Tigra. And today we'll be discussing a lot of interesting things. So it'll be a super fun session and, uh, you know, filled with knowledge. Uh, so we'll be discussing all about Calico and we'll be discussing a lot of things. So I hope you enjoy uh, and you learn a lot. And in the end, we'll be having a swag giveaway. So I'll just uh, paste the link to a Google form. So make sure you fill your name and email over there uh, because that's the only way where I would be able to pick you as a winner. Uh, then I'll paste that in the chat. Hello. Okay, we have folks. And so this is the form link. Please make sure you have your entries over there and then we'll select the winner. Uh, so let's get started and we have a lot of cover. I do not want to waste any, any time. So Alex, my first uh, thing that uh, I would like for the community. So first, uh, let me just give you a context over there. So it's about Kubernetes networking. So Calico is a Kubernetes networking solution. Uh, and uh, Kubernetes is just an orchestration system, if you don't know, and it helps you manage, uh, you know, thousands and billions of containers, uh, orchestrate them, manage them, monitor them, and uh, uh, you give your desired state, it keeps you up to date with, with that particular state. Uh, so, uh, but to make it happen, yeah, there's a networking thing, uh, which is a very, very, very big piece of Kubernetes that helps, uh, you know, or to the node to node connectivity, port to port connectivity. So all those things uh, happens via the Kubernetes networking, which is handled by a Kubernetes networking solutions out of which Calico is one. So before that, uh, I want uh, Alex, you to give a very, very high level overview of how uh, networking in Kubernetes work on, on a very, you know, like a 30,000 feet overview. Sure, yeah. So um, Kubernetes was uh, quite advanced when it first came out in, in that it, it did define quite clearly what it expected from the network. It didn't say how you had to, how you're going to implement it, um, but it did say how the network should look and behave from the point of view of your, your workloads. Um, so the first thing that they did was they said um, every pod in Kubernetes gets its own IP address. And that might sound, uh, these days, that might just sound like, well, well yeah, obviously. Um, but at the time, uh, Docker networking by default, for example, wasn't doing this. And instead, you had to have all sorts of port mapping so that containers didn't clash with the same ports, which was massively complicated. Uh, whereas by going for a, a, pod, a pod having its own IP address, you can treat pods really operationally very similar to how you might have managed VMs or, or even servers on your network. They have an IP address. Um, there can be any number of applications that are running in them. In the pod context, that would be you have a pod, it has an IP address. You can have any number of containers running inside the pod. Um, so, that's, so that's the first key principle. Um, the second principle was that pods can talk directly to each other with their IP addresses. 
um, without using NAT, network address translation. So specifically what this means is when a pod uh, sends a packet to another pod's IP address, the IP addresses in the packet don't, don't change as they're traversing the network. So it's a very simple connection with the fewest possible moving parts. Now, on top of that, um, Kubernetes also implements uh, services as a way of grouping pods together um, into a network service. And typically, when pods are talking to each other in Kubernetes, they'll usually do it via a service. And you can think of a service as, as, a, as a virtual load balancer that's running on every node in your cluster. Now, that, might ins that, that itself, as part of that load balancing, will change some of the IP addresses. Um, but the underlying network itself still remains very simple. Um, one way in which the network is simpler is um, if you think about how network security is traditionally being done in the enterprise, it's very often been done with a specific physical topology and uh, physical firewalls or routers or virtual firewalls that are aware of that topology and special meanings of different IP address ranges. Um, Kubernetes gets rid of all of that with its flat network. So instead, it has to introduce a, a new mechanism for a network security, which is network policy. Um, and network policy is really great in a Kubernetes context because you don't have to be a networking expert to write network policies. You write them in the same way in YAML, uh, in the same way as any other resource that you're creating in, in uh, Kubernetes. And they use the same kinds of ideas, such as label selectors, to define which pods the, the rules apply to. Uh, so it really, uh, it really simplifies the overall network design, and it makes it easier for people to uh, secure the network who might previously not have known how to do that. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty interesting. Uh, so you, every pod gets its, gets, its, gets its own IP, and most of the objects in Kubernetes services, they have their own IPs. Uh, so we have to have some sort of, you know, uh, knowledge about how uh, the Kubernetes administrator, they set up the pod CIDR or the CIDR ranges at least, uh, so that you give a specific pod range. Uh, so the, all the pods will get the pod IPs within that range. Uh, so can you tell a bit about that range, like how, how best we can select that particular range, maybe in Calico's perspective or uh, how we can do that? Um, so typically what people will do for that range is they'll, they'll um, define a range that they think is large enough for uh, the scale of the cluster that they want to, to build. Um, so that might be a, a slash 16 CIDR, or it might be a slash 20, whatever, whatever scale you think you're likely to go up to. Um, and you'll typically allocate that from a private address space range. And depending on how you're, um, what kind of networking you're actually using under the covers in Kubernetes and how you want your pod networking to interact with the rest of your enterprise-wide networking, whether that's on-prem or in a public cloud, um, you might reuse, uh, if you've got multiple clusters, you might actually reuse the same pod side as in, in each of the clusters. Now, if you do that, that obviously means that um, pods in one cluster can't directly talk to pods in another cluster. They'd have to do that via an ingress control. Across um, the whole enterprise. So some, you know, very large SaaS providers that we work with who have taken that option. So every pod across 10,000 servers plus has a unique IP address. So they always know exactly uh, when, when they see some network traffic, they always know without any doubt like where it came from and where it's going to. So there's a lot of flexibility there really. Um, as I say, some of it depends on um, what network plugin you're choosing to use. So with Kubernetes, it does come with some very basic networking capabilities built in uh, using something like KubeNet. Um, and but that's, that's in most scenarios that's too basic and what you'll actually want to do is extend that either with cloud provider specific network plugins 
or with um, a CNI plugin uh, such as Gecko uh, or Flannel. Um, and CNI is, a, is the standard API that's defined in Kubernetes to allow network plugins to, to plug in and replace or supplement uh, the Kubernetes capabilities. Yeah, so that that's actually was my next question. Uh, so what is basically CNI and how Kubernetes came up with this idea of CNI and why it exists in first place? Because it, it wants uh, multiple networking solutions to be developed uh, on, on a single form factor, basically a single uh, set of spec, which is there that they follow. And uh, so that it, all the C, all the uh, networking solutions that follow the CNI, they can, they can be pluggable with Kubernetes. So how, how this is, can you explain a bit about that? Yeah, the way to think about CNI is, is basically, it's a very simple, very simple API um, that allows um, Kubernetes or some other orchestrator to call into a network plugin to uh, add a container to a network or remove a container from a network or to allocate an IP address for a container for a network. So there's different types of CNI plugins. And quite often you can kind of mix and match them together to give you the best combination that's gonna be right, gonna be right for yourself. Um, so it's a very simple interface. Um, it started off its life uh, pre-Kubernetes in fact. Um, and at the time there was also um, another API uh, that the Docker folks had created, I think called CNM. Um, but of the two, the Kubernetes community decided that CNI was the simpler and more extensible. So Kubernetes ended up uh, adopting CNI, and um, and and now that's basically the main way that you do all of this stuff. Now the CNI project does actually provide some CNI plugins upstream. Um, so for example, there's uh, a bridge plugin. There's a there's a um, uh, host local IP address management plugin. Um, and some of those can be useful for you. Um, if you're using Calico, then you would use the Calico CNI plugin typically to provide uh, the, the networking. Um, but Calico is a little bit different from some CNIs in that uh, the way we designed the Calico architecture was to be pretty flexible. So Calico can also run on top of um, other networking. So for example, if you run uh, EKS in, in AWS um, and you want to add network policy, then you do that by uh, adding Calico on top of uh, the existing cluster. And that existing cluster is running the Amazon VPC CNI that's written by the Amazon team. So Calico is designed to be able to, to fit on top of other networks or provide the full network itself. And in all of those scenarios, it helps uh, provide the network policy enforcement. Okay, so uh, now we know that uh, for communities, we need networking. For networking, we have various solutions, and uh, all we and the user has the option to choose, uh, you know, between the different flavors of the CNIs that are available out there. And uh, Calico is one of them. So, uh, at first place, what was the vision behind uh, Calico? I mean, why it was created, and what was missing at that point of time? Yeah, I mean, you're going back. You're going back quite a few years now, and. Um... To be fair, when we when we first started evangelizing the ideas behind Calico, um, half the people we spoke to thought we were crazy. Um, whereas <laughs> whereas now the, the world's moved on and it's like, oh yeah, of course that's how you should do it. Um, but yeah, at the time, um, so one of my co-founders, uh, Christopher Lillian Stolpe, um, he had been working, um, uh, helping manage um, OpenStack clusters for uh, for um bioinformatics companies and um uh one day he had this vm in this rack can't talk to this vm in this rack they're like two feet away from each other and he started trying to diagnose it with openstack how what is openstack doing for networking um and he basically spent all week on weekend on it and couldn't figure it out um, so he had to like uninstall the entire cluster and reinstall it to get it working again now that might sound like a, a story that happens to a lot of us, but um, when you put it in the context 
Um, Christopher is previously responsible for managing a third of the internet in one of his previous jobs. So this is a guy that can look at network on a global scale, uh, figure out you know, cross-continental networking issues and get them fixed in a few minutes. And he couldn't work out how to get traffic from one VM on one server to another VM in another server, like two feet apart. Um, so really that told him there's something wrong. So he took a step back and he said, okay, how would I build a network? Because <laughs> we know how to build networks already. Like we've built the internet and it works mostly pretty well. Um, so that was basically the Calico philosophy. We said, well, let's build, uh, let's build a network that behaves uh, more like the internet. Um, we're not going to invent wild and wacky new things. Because um, at the time, a lot of the people writing container network plugins, uh, they weren't networking experts. So they were kind of figuring it all out for themselves. Whereas we had an advantage, which is like, well, we are networking experts. And so it's like, oh, yeah, you can do this thing here. And this is really easy. And it works really well. And it scales really well. Um, so that's basically the approach we took with Calico. Now, we did do it slightly differently than if you were building the internet, because we wanted to, in terms of a software architecture, we wanted to build it from the start in a cloud native architecture. So just like Kubernetes, um, Calico started by using etcd as a shared data store um, to store a state in exactly the same way that Kubernetes does. Um, and you can still run Calico in that mode today. Uh, most people will run Calico just uh, using the Kubernetes API as its source of truth rather than it needing its own data store. Um, but but that's, where, that's basically where it came from. So it was a, a cloud cloud native implementation of sensible routed networks, which we know scale and uh, that's how you build the internet. I mean, that's that's pretty interesting story. Uh, I don't know how many of uh, you were aware of that, uh, which which Alex just mentioned. Uh, so how Calico started is, is really something that uh, uh, is you know kind of interesting uh, from a global level a person who is able to solve the global networking problems uh, and not able to figure out uh, two feet apart two VMs not talking to each other uh, led to the foundations of uh, Calico. <laughs> that that is interesting. So now when Calico was was built, uh, was the initial thought that um, uh, from the beginning itself was that it will be uh, a you know, a CNI for Kubernetes, or was it something different? It was um, it was something different. So the very very first version of Calico, which was um, about six six years ago, was I think version 0.1. Um, that was for OpenStack. Um, okay. So we started with OpenStack, and um, and then a few months after that, we started building for containers as being, you know, well, OpenStack is, it's all right. There was a lot of people using it at the time, but clearly containers was going to be exciting. So we started building for containers. Now there was not, um, at that time, there wasn't a clear winner in uh, the container orchestration. So you had Docker with Compose and Swarm. You had uh, Mesosphere, you had uh, Mesos and Marathon, and uh, you had the Google folks and Red Hat who were, busy doing Kubernetes. Um, and so we supported all of those platforms, um, kept us very busy going to conferences, uh, explaining how to do network sensibly to all of these audiences. Um, and then over time, uh, it became apparent that, you know, Kubernetes is the one. Um, so we were able to focus all of our efforts on, on Kubernetes. Okay, now uh, we, do still have, we do still have big OpenStack users, though. For example, um, there's some okay. people that you know that OpenStack's not going away, and Calico continues to have the architectural flexibility to support it. But yeah, I'd say 99% of our users are on on Kubernetes these days. Interesting. So uh, now that we know, like the Calico, how it was built, and was now it is now it fits in the Kubernetes architecture pretty well. Uh, so how, as a user, or maybe not as a user, because user might not want 
uh, something complex uh, for their workloads. But maybe a, a startup or a mid-size organization, if they want to, if they are starting on the journey uh, towards Kubernetes and they see, okay, oh, now I, after the Kubedm in it, if it's successful, but now I need a networking solution to implement. So how do I choose between different networking solutions out there? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot to choose from, and um, you know, obviously, I I'm gonna say a lot of positive things about Calico because that's a project I'm intimately involved in. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of projects to choose from. Um, one thing that I would recommend is um, you pick a project that um, has a good network policy implementation, and um, even if you're uh, even if you think we're probably not going to write network policies straight away. Um, you really should be writing network policies because your cluster is uh, very vulnerable until you do that from a security point of view. And um, you want to make that transition as easy and smooth for yourself as possible and not have like, oh my gosh, we've got to rip out the in entire network and replace it with something new. Um, so there's a fair few... Um, there's a fair few Kubernetes network plugins that support uh, Kubernetes network policy. Um, I think Calico might be the only one that supports the full Kubernetes network policy specification. Um, it certainly was until relatively recently. I couldn't I couldn't be certain that there aren't others that have have caught up now. Um, so that's obviously important as well because you don't want to be when you do get to use network policy, you don't want to find that you had a security breach because you define a network policy and it turned out your network plugin didn't really know how to enforce that particular network policy. Um, so th those are some of the reasons why I'd recommend Calico. I mean, I'd also recommend Calico just because it's been, um, you know, work hardened by the community. Um, we estimate that Calico's uh, running on um, in excess of 2 million nodes every day. And um, that's like quite a lot of usage over many years. And so it doesn't matter if you're running, you know, a little two or three node cluster or a thousand node cluster. Um, Calico's had all of that, that level of, of testing and stress. Um, so you know, you know you're getting something that's, that's tried and trusted. Uh, okay, so meaning that uh, yes network policy is really important and as per, as per like alex is saying uh, so even when you are building the startup or, or the product basically i would not use the word startup again and again basically you are building a product and you want to launch something uh, so that particular application when you are deploying on kubernetes or you are creating the cluster it's it's super important to enforce the network policies uh, because if you don't do it now then it will be troublesome in future if you don't think about it now, it will be troublesome in future because uh, that that particular mentality of Kubernetes is secure by default is completely wrong uh, because it is actually not secure by default. And there are a lot of things uh, you have to do to make it hard. I would not say that it will be still be 100% uh, you know, uh, secured and nobody can hack it. So there are a lot of vulnerabilities that you might have seen in the past recent, and there is a new SIG, SIG security, which has been formed especially for this particular purpose to improve the security aspects within Kubernetes. Uh, so I think it's super important to have the network uh, policies applied to the cluster, even if you are starting, don't wait for till your you know beta launch or, or your first initial launch, and then you will think, okay, we have a small user base, and now we should not think, and then we'll think when we'll grow massive. I think, uh, the right strategy is uh, in going moving it's it's basically uh, writing the code in in the right format and not just uh, uh, doing anything uh, which is not as per the standards uh, so this this particular aspect should not be ignored uh, then uh, my next uh, thing is uh, well, I'll just I'll just add to I'll just add to what yeah. you said if it's okay um, I, I mean I I would definitely encourage people People to start using network policies from the beginning. Um, that'll be the easiest way of getting, you know, educating yourself on them um, and making sure you're doing the right things as you go go along. Um, then to try and sort of un untangle a mess at the end. Um, now, if you do need to untangle a mess at the end, 
Um, there are some tools you can use that can that can help you, including um, capabilities that, say, Calico Enterprise has. But for the moment, we'll just stick with open source. Um, the best practice is definitely to do this stuff as you go along. And if you um, go to the Calico documentation, um, we've got some nice little guides in there that introduce you to various aspects of Kubernetes networking and network policy, show you some of the best practices. Um, and if you follow those, uh, you'll actually find it pretty easy to learn this stuff and, and to make your make your cluster much more secure at the network level. Yes, so make sure this point, uh, I mean, you know this point because this is super important. Uh, Alex, can you tell uh, like a brief about the Calico architecture, like on the whole, how it works? I can bring up the architecture if you want. Um, it's pretty simple, really. Um, so the the main thing is there's a Calico node daemon set that runs on every node in the cluster. Um, that has a few containers in it. Um, so one of the things that will do with, is, um, depending on what configuration you've given it, it will actually install Calico CNI plugin uh, on each node and configure that. Um, if you're um, running BGP as part of your network, then um, it will it will run a BGP daemon uh, on each node, so that it's uh, routing routing protocol aware. Um, BGP for for those people that aren't familiar with it is basically it's a standards based protocol um, that's been implemented in um, physical routers and is one of the key protocols that we use to scale the internet. So it's basically used to uh, as a very efficient way of exchanging uh, routes between uh, different routers. And essentially what Calico is doing in this model is it's kind of acting as if each one of your nodes was a virtual router. So all of the pod network uh, just does IP address, basic routing. Um, and this is why this is why it keeps it simple, and this is why it scales really well. Um, but you don't have to use uh, you don't have to use BGP in a Calico network. Um, you might want to if you're running on premise. Typically, you'll, you'd use BGP to uh, to allow Calico to talk to your physical uh, top of rack routers, um, and then that means that you don't have to run any kind of overlay network and the packet that leaves your pod is the packet that goes on the physical wire and you get really good performance. So that's one reason why you might run BGP. Um, the second daemon that's really, uh, the second container in Calico node that's super important is um, uh, Felix. So Felix is Calico's uh, policy engine. And so what, what Felix is doing on each node is it's watching the state of the cluster um, and it's working out which network policies apply to the pods on that node. And for those for those network policies is working out exactly what rules it needs to program into the kernel. Now then how it programs it into the kernel is quite flexible. So Calico supports uh, multiple different data planes. Um, so we have um, standard Linux data plane, uh, which is um, what most people will be familiar with. We also have a pure eBPF data plane, which um, is pretty exceptional uh, if you're running on a new enough kernel to support it. Um, and we have a Windows data plane. And then there are additional data planes being worked on uh, in uh, the Calico community. So the long uh, data plane coming based on a technology called VPP. Uh, VPP is uh, vector packet processing data plane. Uh, that was originally developed to to run inside routers uh, when their custom silicon became had something that was too complicated to do they could do all the switching in bpp very fast on uh, on intel chips and um, so that's that's where that came from so again with calico we're not really just about a single technology we're we're really um our philosophy is use the right the right tool for the job uh, and that will be different for different people depending on their environment. And um, earlier I mentioned uh, that you don't even have to use Calico networking to use Calico. So the example I gave was in EKS where you're using the Amazon VPC CNI plugin. Now you can run 
uh, EKS using the Calico CNI plugin if you want to. But for most people, using Amazon's VPC CNI plugin is probably the most sensible choice. And Calico runs on top of that with the same policy engine Felix to enforce all the security for you. Yeah, I mean, uh, so many things are there. Uh, I would not uh, say that it's super simple architecture uh, because uh, Calico is covering a lot of portions, uh, a lot of bits and pieces and gives you a lot of flexibility to choose from when you are uh, you know, configuring it. So uh, I think uh, that's, that's what makes it, it very powerful when you have a lot of flexibility options and based on your choice, uh, you can select uh, uh you know the proper configuration of what exactly you want to run uh so i think that's that's also one of the powerpoint uh feature of of calico yeah and you 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 you're dead right that there's a lot of different options and the, which one is right for you is um if you've got to figure it out all for yourself from scratch um it's probably quite hard to figure out what's the optimum um, the good news is it's very easy to get Calico running in, in the modes which will work anywhere. So, for example, you can fire Calico up in VXLAN overlay mode, and it will basically run in any environment, um, and you don't have to make any decisions. Um, but that might not actually be the, the optimal networking for you. Um, so one of the things that we have in the Calico documentations is uh, we've tried to structure the getting started guides to be a different guide for each environment. So if you're using managed public cloud uh, services like EKS or GKE uh, or AKS, we've got a guide for each of those that says, hey, here's your options and here's how you set them up. Um, if you're building your own cluster in AWS, we've got a guide for that. If you're installing on-premise onto physical servers, we've got guides for that. Um, so those will, those will point you in, in a good direction. And then we have a pretty good community as well. So we have Calico uh, Slack group, which I think is up to, um, I can't remember if it's 4,000 or 5,000 members now. So there's a lot of people that you know, pop in, get, get a bit of help, uh, get their, answers, their questions answered and, and then move on to be very successful. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, to that point, I uh, just want to add one thing that uh, Calico does a lot and a lot of free trainings. Uh, so if you check out uh, the their YouTube channel as well, so they do, I mean, more than weekly trainings on different topics covering different networking pieces uh, from basics to very advanced level. Uh, so probably all these uh, free trainings, you know, uh, you can just attend them and they are recorded as well. So even if now you go, you can attend them. Uh, so they, they are pretty awesome. And recently um, there, is, there was a course which was uh, just launched uh which is uh, calico certified calico operator level one uh, i'm just posting a link for that so just enroll for that it's, it's a free course and probably you'll get to learn tons of things from uh from it and also there is a book uh which is i think uh networking uh calico yeah networking something networking book is there that that was their In, PDF. introduction to kubernetes networking I think yes yeah, even that is that is a very powerful resource. Uh, I I always stress on uh, you know understanding the networking properly because if you know what exactly is happening on your cluster, then your observability becomes better. You uh, understand better what is actually happening in your cluster when something goes wrong, because that is important. And uh, something will definitely go wrong. Uh, you have to have this mindset because you can't just spin up a cluster and run workloads and it's it's done and never anything is going to happen so it doesn't work like this uh, so things will go wrong and if you know certain pieces uh, when when you scale especially when you scale so if you know uh, certain aspects of networking how it is working internally within kubernetes and how if you have chosen calico as one of the options then uh, with their documentation and the uh, you know community support uh, you will be able to figure out where exactly the you know uh, the differentiator is or where exactly the problem lies so that that can be fixed so that sort of uh, information uh, is is out there for you free uh, so make sure you you know uh, check out the uh, this uh, book as well as the certified operator and this actually came out in, in december right the first first week of december uh, the certified uh, operator training so i think that's that's very recent very new yeah, that's right. 
fresh coverage so make sure you uh, make use yeah. of that and yeah and so it's super uh, it's super it's super easy to get started with that as well basically all you need is a um, a half decent laptop and then um, near the beginning of the course we we've got a bunch of scripts that will set up a little cluster um, actually embedded on your laptop to keep things really simple and consistent for you um, and then we take you through um, we've we've structured it as four weeks uh, but a lot of people are just doing it all in one day so it's four weeks if you've got a few hours available each week to to study the course or you can get the whole thing done in um, you know eight to ten hours and um, you should get end to end and you get a nice certific certification at the end yeah and and you can see people in the chat uh, some of them have already you know uh, taken it and uh, you can see the comments and actually it's good uh, so just go out and take this so that was something like uh, about uh, a good product is uh, a product with a good uh, documentation uh, plus all the material or the learning resources and the community because community is the one that drives uh, the the product uh, so I think uh, Alex has just went so he he'll join back in uh, even my camera is looking a little blurred let me just stop and start the cam again or let me just see why it is not working for the right way yeah yeah he's he's back okay cool uh so no i did no idea what happened there my screen just suddenly went uh, logging back in again oh <laughs> uh it's it's fine uh so that's why it's not a conference so it's it's just uh, you know live stream with the community so things uh, go wrong uh it's, it's completely fine so in in um uh, we have some a concept called route reflectors so can you throw some uh, light on that like what are they and when they should be used yeah route, route reflectors are um uh, they're interesting they're basically a bgp concept so so normally in bgp um i'll use an on on-premise example because it's, it's simple to talk about so normally in a, in a network in your on-prem data center, then at the top of each rack of servers, you'll have a, a router called a top of rack router or a TOR is a, it's abbreviated to. Um, and that will typically be able to, to, that will typically be doing routing at L3 uh, using BGP. And if that's the case, then Calico, each of the nodes that are running on the servers in, in that rack can talk to the top of rack router at the top of their rack. Um, and the topology is quite simple and uh, no individual uh, device has to talk BGP to lots of other people. Okay, so you can think of it, you end up with basically like a tree of BGP connections. So it scales really well. Uh, now there's different kinds of networks. Um, so imagine if your top of rack wasn't doing layer three routing and instead was just switching at, at layer two. Um, that's quite rare these days, but you do still come across it or you'll come across other environments, not on-prem, maybe in public cloud where you can treat the whole thing as layer two. Um, and in that scenario, if you're using, if you configured Calico to use BGP as the way it was exchanging routes, rather than Calico, each Calico node talking to um, the top of rack in, in its in its rack of servers, each Calico node has to talk to every other Calico node because there isn't this tree structure anymore uh, that's natural. Um, and that works fine because BGP is actually a really efficient protocol. But once you get up to you know several hundred nodes, um, that's quite a lot of connections that are going on all the time. And it does start to have some... Uh, small performance impact that you probably want to avoid. And this is where you can bring in the concept of a route reflector. So a route reflector kind of allows you to put that hierarchy back in place. Uh, the route reflector is, is like a hub where all of your nodes can talk to a route reflector. It will listen to what everybody's saying and then it distributes the routes out. So you end up with more of a kind of star shape. And then if you get like really massive clusters that are running in this mode, you can build hierarchies of, of route reflectors in a tree shape. 
So really this will scale like literally to the size of the internet. Um, Kubernetes itself won't sell, scale that far. Um, but basically, yeah, that's what a route reflector is, is if you're using BGP for, for if you're using Calico BGP, um, you're not peering with your top of rack routers. Um, at some point you want to introduce uh, route reflectors to just reduce the amount of BGP traffic that's going across the cluster. Um, and there's um, a chap in the community who's been, who's written an operator for uh, configuring route reflectors automatically for you uh, in these large Calico networks. Um, so if you if you are in that scenario, then then reach out to me and I can I can point you in the right direction. Um, the reality is that most people aren't in that scenario. Um, most people, uh, I you know I would recommend if you need to run a large network in that mode. You know, you could switch on VXLAN mode. That doesn't use BGP at all. It's just one fewer moving parts. Um, but again, uh, you know, which is going to be absolutely the most optimum for your scenario? Um, there's, you know, there's quite a lot of things to consider, and that's why we built in that built in that flexibility. Yeah. So uh, two things over here. One is uh, like you talked about massive clusters. So let's take an example of 100 node clusters. So if you are using BGP mode uh, and you have a 100 node cluster and when whenever it scales, uh, so uh, when, you, when we consider about the node to node networking, so it had it have to add the address because, because every node has to know that this particular node has joined the cluster. So uh, that particular thing when adds up and it's already a hundred node cluster when more number of nodes join. So the performance automatically uh, a bit degrades and it takes more time for that particular node to join the network and completely be in ready state. Uh, so that's very... you, now you're, you're very unlikely to notice it in terms of network performance itself, right? So what, what, what we're talking about here is, um, you know, small increases in CPU uh, that that um, if you really care about performance, you you want to avoid when you get to those scales. Okay, so uh, if we have massive clusters, so we go for route reflectors. Yeah, if you're if you're running Calico in BGP mode. Um, yeah, Calico. In BGP mode. But you know, suppose if you're running Calico on uh, GKE, for example. You wouldn't be running BGP at all, so you don't have to worry about route reflectors at all. Same, you know, same in EKS, AKS. Um, BGP doesn't BGP doesn't come into the picture at all. Okay, that that was interesting. Uh, so route reflectors is is something that I always wanted to explore. Uh, so this is this is some interesting topic that that I learned and hope the community also learns. Uh, next. Next up is IPv6 and IPv4 dual stack support and in Kubernetes, which is there now. And uh, IPv6 is, is there for quite some time now, but uh, uh, the community is, is slowly adopting it. Uh, so what are your takes on it? Because Calico supports uh, IPv4, IPv6 dual stack networking. Uh, I think that's that's the only one I'm I'm really not sure, but I do think that's the only one that supports dual stack networking. If you want to set up a cluster that has IPv4 and IPv6 uh, both enabled, uh, so you can do it only via Calico. So I mean, uh, how does that work? Yeah, I mean Calico. Uh, Calico had IPv6. You know, you know when I said that 0 0.1 version for OpenStack that was six years ago. Um, I think 0 0.2 had. Was 0.1 was IPv4 and 0.2 was IPv6, like two weeks later. So we designed it in from the beginning to be IPv6 capable. Um, and if you search the internet, you'll find blogs from people who have been running Calico uh, successfully, IPv6 with Kubernetes, uh, for quite a long time, um, probably since before most people thought Kubernetes supported IPv6. Uh, you know, there's some pretty hardcore users out there. Um, uh, more recently, Kubernetes has been improving its IPv6 support, including um, adding support for dual stack. And uh, so in dual stack, um, you know, all of your pods get both an IPv4 and an IPv6 address. And when you create a Kubernetes service, you can specify whether you want that service to be IPv4 or IPv6. 
and um, Calico supports all of that seamlessly. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure if it's the only one that, that does that currently, uh, but we certainly were until very recently if it has changed. Yep. Uh, so uh, when when we say that, uh, so do we have uh, enough documentation on this as well? Uh, because this is something new. So the dual stack support in Kubernetes and how to set up that. Is, is there documentation available for that as well? Yeah, so there's documentation. Um, I think there's documentation in the Calico website about using dual stack. Um, okay. I know uh, I'm less familiar with what the current state of um, the Kubernetes documentation is. Um, so dual stack has been kind of evolving over the last few releases. And um, I'd say um, I've heard, heard that it's pretty much ready now. Um, I don't know if it still has any rough edges that they're still working on, um, but but uh, the Calico part of it works very smoothly. Yeah, setting up a dual stack cluster uh, would definitely take some time uh, with the current uh, docs, docs that are available. Uh, so if yeah. anybody wants to try, you have to figure out, uh, you know, you have to search a lot. <laughs> So uh, Saurabh has a question, uh, how many nodes uh, we can scale with road reflectors? So that was with the previous discussion. Yeah, I mean, so really the, um, the, the rare reflectors don't impose any, any limit on the number of nodes. Um, so we've tested Calico uh, reasonably regularly up to several thousand node clusters um, because that's, uh, that's what some of our customers need. Um, and, you know, there's whether you're using route reflectors or you're using BGP on-prem or you're using a cloud provider networking, um, none of those are usually the limit. Usually the limit is um, Kubernetes itself and uh, what scale that it can cope with. And um, one of the... Uh, we were talking about Calico architecture earlier. One component that I didn't mention um, uh, is called Typha. Um, so one of the things that uh, Calico has to do is monitor the state of the cluster. So in the same way as, say, something like QProxy uh, has to monitor the state of the cluster all the time. Anytime a new pod comes along in a service, it has to update how it's doing the load balancing on every node. Calico is kind of the same, both for both for the networking stuff, it needs to know where everything is, but also for the network policy enforcement, it needs to know, okay, what are all the pod IPs and what are their labels and all of that. So Calico is watching um, the state of the Kubernetes uh, resources quite quite closely. Um, and when you're on you know, a 3,000 node cluster, um, your API server has to be sized pretty big just to cope with QProxy. Um, but then if you put uh, Calico on top of it, um, you probably kind of just doubled the load on Kube proxy if you just did it naively. Um, so there's an extra component in Calico called Typha. And this is basically a, um, a Kubernetes API um, caching proxy might be the way to think about it. So you can run three or four instances of Typha. They're the things that talk to the Kubernetes API server. So from the Kubernetes API server point of view, the load is tiny. It's just four more pods doing watches on the data store. Um, but then Typha is designed to be uh, you know, super fast and scalable at um, passing on any updates to uh, all of the Calico nodes that are running uh, on each of the nodes. Um, so by doing that, um, we mostly eliminate the load that Calico puts on your Kubernetes API server. And, and that was historically uh, the, the, key, the key point at which Kubernetes doesn't work anymore is basically when the API server doesn't work anymore. Yeah, because the API server is, is the sole uh, thing that is talking to all different components and managing all things. So that if yeah. that crashes, then your cluster crashes. Yeah. Well, so, I, another way of yeah. thinking about it is, it, a lot of a lot of Kubernetes is horizontally scalable, right? The kubelet does one kubelet per node that has to work out what it has to do on that node, 
And that cubelet doesn't really care how many other cubelets there are. Um, Calico is designed the same way. It runs Calico node on each node. That's horizontally scalable. Um, each node only has to worry about what's on that node, right? So that works really well. Um, but then the, the cloud native way of architecting these things is they all talk to a source of truth, the data store. And it's that data store that doesn't always uh, horizontally scale in quite the same way. So there's another question by someone. Does Calico enforce the same policies with while integrating with any service mesh? Um, yeah, so let, there's so there's two different there's two different things there. So um, Calico by default is enforcing its network policies. Um, you can think of it at the network layer, the infrastructure layer, and um, in that sense, Calico doesn't care whether there's a service mesh or, or what's running in the pods on top of it. It can always enforce that policy. Um, there's a second enforcement mode that Calico supports, which is um, you can actually integrate Calico with uh, Istio, and then Calico will enforce uh, network policy at the application application layer within the service mesh by plugging into Envoy as, a, as a, an authorization controller. So what that gives you is um, you have, still have the enforcement of the network layer, and then you have the enforcement of the application layer. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're super hot on the best security, having those multiple enforcement points does help close down some, some attack vectors. Um, now, for a lot of people, that's overkill, so they don't really they don't really bother. Um, and I'd say that for a lot of people, uh, service mesh is, is overkill as well. Um, but I'm not going to say don't use service mesh because if you're one of the people that write for, then use it. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's quite shiny, but it's quite complicated to, to operate as well. And depending on what your requirements are, so – you know, one common requirement that people use service mesh for is encryption, um, where they've got some kind of um, compliance requirement uh, that says all the traffic that goes across the network has to be encrypted. And one way you can do that is using service mesh. Um, another way you can do it is to switch on encryption of the network layer. So Calico, for example, supports um, an in encryption technology called WireGuard, which was recently added to the Linux kernel. Yeah. So you can you can with basically one config change. It's just a it's just a setting. You say, okay, I want you to use encryption now, and at that point, all of your pod to pod traffic will be encrypted when it's going over the wire, and you didn't introduce anything into your operational complexity at all in order to be able to achieve that. Yeah, I think uh, uh, thanks, Alex, for bringing this particular point uh, for the encryption one. So WireGuard is something that was recently introduced. And uh, uh, so like Alex mentioned, you don't have to, there's no operational overhead or additional thing that you have to do. Uh, so Calico is, is fully supporting WireGuard and you get the benefit of encryption uh, of the traffic that is, uh, you know, uh, traveling in your cluster. So so hopes, uh, hopefully uh, it answers your uh, your particular question, uh, Suman, as well. Uh, next up, we have a super interesting topic. Uh, I think most of the people are here for that, which is eBPF. Uh, so Alex, just tell us all about it. So, <laughs> uh, so what is eBPF and uh, like wow, why the community is excited about it and why the community wants to use it, what benefits it has, and how Calico uh, comes in the picture when we talk about eBPF. Yeah, so eBPF is a is a pretty exciting technology in the kind of Linux kernel level. Um, it's much broader than networking. Uh, so what eBPF allows you to do is to write um, little micro programs and have them executed by the kernel. And those micro programs, you can insert them um, in um, various different points within the kernel. There's a there's a, there's a list of places you can attach them. Um, so it might be you could attach one anytime a program is trying to open a socket, it's going to call your mini program. And your mini program could potentially do something to, to change uh, what the kernel's behavior would normally be. Um, so 
that's kind of quite exciting, right? Because you don't have to wait for a new kernel version to have your super funky feature in. Uh, you can just build it yourself. Um, and previously, the only real way to do this would have been to build your own kernel module. Um, but there's often quite a lot of security concerns around uh, running third-party kernel modules in, in large enterprises. Now, some large enterprises have security concerns about uh, running eBPF programs as well. Um, so it's not that eBPF is a, is a magical solution for those security concerns, um, but it does reduce them for some people. So that's, so that's why it's exciting. Um, in the context of, um, and you'll see a lot of the uh, monitoring solutions uh, use eBPF now to do all sorts of fancy things. Um, so if you think about, say, projects like um, Falco, for example, that started off with a kernel module as the way that you got all your Falco telemetry. Um, they still have that kernel module, but they also support eBPF. Um, so so um, it's definitely much broader than networking. Uh, within networking, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a variety of different hooks that you can uh, go in and, and uh, add your little programs to. Um, now I would say that in networking, um, in my humble opinion, eBPF has been um, overly marketed and hyped by, by uh, some people within the community as being um, this magical thing. Um, and it isn't a magical thing. Uh, well, it kind of is, but it, you know, it's not a magical thing all the time for everybody. Um, just because it's written in an eBPF doesn't mean it's better. So I remember sitting in uh, KubeCon talks where the speaker's standing up and saying like, oh, and then eBPF gets compiled down to the specific microarchitecture, so it's all bytecode, and you can't get any faster than that. And I'm thinking, oh, you mean like all of the kernel code that's already been compiled to bytecode, right? <laughs> There's nothing magical about eBPF code that makes it faster than the kernel code. Um, what it does let you do, though, is modify what the kernel might do. Um, and sometimes you can modify what the kernel would do in a way that uh, skips something the kernel would do that might have been slow that you didn't really need it to do. And that's the trick that we've done with eBPF data plane in, uh, in Calico. Um, so when we were developing the eBPF data plane, um, we spent many months researching every single possible kernel primitive we could think of um, in eBPF and beyond, um, putting them all together in any way that we thought might make a viable data plane, testing, micro benchmarking the performance and finding out what, what really works. And a lot of the things that on paper sounded like, oh, wow, this is going to be amazing. We've just skipped 10,000 lines of code, turned out to be slower. Because it's like, oh, yeah, those 10,000 lines of code are like super, super clever and optimized over 25 years. And we bypassed them. And now we have one more uh, nappy poll. So the whole thing is ruined. Right. So it's actually quite hard to make, uh, to make a data plane that's faster um, than the standard Linux networking. Um, but we were able to do it uh, for Calico. Um, and we're pretty, we're pretty proud of, of where we got to. So if you're um, a particularly network intensive workloads um, and you want to run on, uh, you're okay running on the newer kernels that have the latest eBPF features, then the Calico eBPF data plane will give you basically the, the best performance that you can, that you can currently get. Um, beyond network performance, um, there's other reasons why it's interesting, even if you're not like a super hardcore network traffic person. So one of the things that it introduces is um, uh, it has native service handling for Kubernetes in it. So you don't have to run kube proxy anymore. Kube proxy, when you get to really large clusters, can become a performance bottleneck. Um, so you don't have that anymore. Calico will handle that all for you and um, outperforms kube proxy by a few orders of magnitude at those scales. Um, now, the other thing that it does as part of that is it always preserves uh, your source IP address so that when you are accessing a service from outside of the cluster, when the packet gets to your pod, it's still got that original client source IP address on it. 
whereas QProxy will typically have had to mangle the packet and, and change some of the IP addresses as it passed through, so you don't really know where the source of the packet came from. Um, now, that might sound, uh, you know, well, that's super low level. Why do I care? Well, there's a few reasons why you care. So, we, you know, we've got we've got users who uh, they need to do things like GOIP checking um, in their applications. And if they don't see the real IP, they can't do that. Um, but even when it comes to things like troubleshooting and looking through your logs, having the real original client IP there is actually very useful. And then the final reason uh, that it's really exciting is because um, it makes it easier to write network policies for these pods that are going to be accessed from the outside world, where you can you can restrict it to a specific range of IP addresses or specific IP address if you want to. Whereas previously, it was actually quite hard to do that um, because the client IP address got lost. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, so it always happens when you are in, in a, you know, a meeting or uh, in a live stream. One time it has to happen that you are talking on mute, else it's not a yeah, virtual not. meeting. <laughs> So it's, I mean, this is really exciting. EBPF whole landscape. Uh, I think, yes, there, there are a lot of KubeCon talks uh, that every time that is there around EBPF and uh, you are very right. People talk about it as a magical thing, but um, uh, so the community now knows what exactly it is. And we, we cannot throw away the, uh, the line that I really liked is we cannot throw away the 25 years of hard work that is built on uh, you know writing the Linux kernel and uh, with with your uh, your thing and you can think that it is fast. Uh, yes, you can definitely contribute uh, to various other things that can make uh, you know things better for you that Calico has done by doing the research and there are different things that can be uh, written to make things more faster, make Linux uh, make the networking more faster. So, but but that cannot be done overnight and it's not magical. So now now you know that. Uh, so make sure you uh, you have the proper understanding of what eBPF is. So I've just pasted a link of eBPF.io, which gives you the basic understanding of what it is, the basic architecture and all that things. And on top of that, uh, whatever Alex has told in, uh, told in, in just uh, you know 10 to 15 minutes of, of this is, is really important. So it, it might be less, but the but each sentence had uh some information that is really very critical so if you have if you have heard uh the last 15 minutes on ebpf uh you will definitely understand uh the the benefits the actual benefits that that it provides and uh, why it's it's exciting so i think uh, uh this particular portion uh is, is really helpful uh for the community to understand the real benefits of ebpf uh, so we are about uh, time, and the last thing that I want to ask you is is basic uh, yeah. difference between my, my, my take. Hello. Sorry, I was having an internet problem. I think it was me. So can you ask, yeah. it, ask the question again? Uh, yeah, so now, now I'm back. So I, I wanted to ask the difference between Calico open source and Calico enterprise. Like uh, we have the open source yeah. full feature that people are using it and it's it can scale up to you know uh, massive clusters. Then why do we have Calico enterprise? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good point. Um, so, so Calico Enterprise builds on top of and around the Calico open source uh, project. Um, and it adds additional capabilities um, that are particularly, particularly useful um, for enterprises. Um, so for example, uh, one thing it does is provide uh, you know, a management dashboard. So if you want to see all your policies visually and edit policies in a, in a GUI with with templates and things like that, then um, then you get all of that. It also has a lot of observability and visibility, so you can you can easily see all the network traffic that's going on in your cluster. 
You can uh, get it to highlight network traffic that is not expecting. Um, it can help manage policies for you. It can it can recommend policies. When you when you're about to to apply a policy, it can tell you, hey, if you apply this policy, this is what I expect to happen to all the traffic that's currently in your cluster. So you can have a look at that and go, oh yeah, no, I didn't mean that. Um, or yes, that's just what I wanted. Um, it allows you to deploy policies actually in within a production cluster. You can deploy policies in a staging mode where they won't actually impact um, any of the traffic, but they will record exactly what they would have done with that traffic. So um, you can have a lot more confidence um, when you're running at scale with mission critical applications that the that you're not about to um, accidentally switch off all the lights because uh, you misspell one of your labels, for example. Um, and then it has things like threat defense and threat feeds, uh, intrusion detection, AI. Um, there's there's just a ton a ton of really uh, cool and exciting features in it. Awesome. So uh, I think uh, this is also a really exciting thing that people can, uh, you know, uh, if you really want all of the extra features on top of the Calico open source, which is already awesome. Uh, so you can go for Calico Enterprise. And uh, I think we have covered a lot today in, in such short time span. We have tried to answer or try to cover a lot of topics uh, which, which connect the dots starting from what Kate's networking is and how to choose the CNI, how Calico works, uh, route reflectors and uh, IPv4, IPv6 dual stack and eBPF. Uh, so pretty much exciting. So I, I was really pumped up for this already. And uh, I think I got a lot of knowledge today. Uh, so thank you, Alex, for, for joining in today. Uh, so I think people are there now for the swag giveaway. So Tigra was, uh, you know, uh, generous enough to give uh, a couple of swag giveaways uh, for the people who have who are there live. Uh, so we have 33 uh, responses, Alex, and I have the Excel sheet open. So we'll do maybe a couple of giveaways. So uh, can you tell me your two uh, just lucky numbers or any numbers uh, in in one to 30, 33 so that I can choose the winners? Well, twelve is a good twelve is a good random number. Okay, 12. so 12, 12 is uh, Chetan. So Chetan is winner number one. Congratulations. Uh, and then let's go for one almost at the end, 32. So you might have 30. turned away, but I bet you're glad you made it. 32. Oh, Sangam. Sangam is uh, winner number two. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, congratulations, Chetan and Sangam. And for the rest of the people who have joined the stream, I hope you learned uh, something new for each level, beginner, intermediate, or advanced. Uh, so hope you learned something today because that's what we are here for. We are here for learning something and, you know, hearing, hearing about like how the product got started and where it is today. So and a lot of exciting features around it. Uh, so I think uh, that's it. So uh, Alexia, yeah, just just before going, what's the vision next for Calico? Uh, just keep making it more awesome. Like time, you know, you like usually open source projects have a lifetime, and um, occasionally I'm quite surprised to think that Calico is six years old now, right? <laughs> but, we're still, <laughs> but we're still adding in like brand new, fresh, exciting features. You know, eBPF was uh, something we added in, uh, added in like last year, and uh, like I say, we've got the VPP data plane coming. We, we just, we're just continuously improving it. Um, uh, you know, a lot of that work is done by engineers at Tigera. So if you're interested in, in working on Calico, then uh, look us up. Or we are hiring, um, but there's also a lot of a lot of work going on on in the community. Um, and that's that's really great. Keeps keeps the keeps the thing fresh and relevant. 
Awesome. So uh, join the community Slack, uh, do the training, uh, read the networking, uh, Kubernetes networking uh, PDF. They all are awesome resources. And like I said before, there are tons of learning videos and the trainings that Calico is doing, Tigra is doing uh, on a weekly basis. So make sure you go to the Slack channel, join it, and there's a free training uh, uh, channel over there. And uh, you can now do that. So just do and learn and learn and learn. Uh, so thank you all for joining and see you. Uh, so this year's, I think this is the last stream for the year. Uh, so have Merry Christmas and uh, Happy New Year in advance to all the community folks uh, who are there and who will be watching this uh, after it is up on my YouTube channel. And thank you, Alex, for joining. You stay for a minute. I'll end the broadcast. All right. Thanks. Bye, everybody.